Kerbonauts, this is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number four of Project Enterprise, and you can see we have before us here a very messed up looking orbiter. In this episode, I had intended to look at updating it with some better FAR values, Ferrum Aerospace numbers. But once I started doing that, I realized that some of my nodes weren't right and some other things were happening, like wing masses were being scaled down automatically. I think it's a feature of Ferrum Aerospace, perhaps. So I'm currently working through a bunch of issues again. It's not ready to fly at the moment, as you can see, but I can at least give you a little look into what it is I've been doing as far as trying to set up some of the values for these wings and the control surfaces. I'm using various reference images, but this is a really good one, so I'll just show you this one, although I do have many images. You can see on this one, it's showing it in inches, so I have to do conversions, but it gives a lot of different points and sizes that I can use to figure out what all the different pieces are supposed to be. Now, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on how these wings get set up because really, I'm learning this as I go along still. And I never went to school for aeronautics or anything like that, so Hopefully I'm getting all of this right, but I'm going to show you what I think I've discovered about how to set up the far wings. To do that, let's take a look at one of these shuttle wings. And then we'll look here in my paint program, and I'll show you I've laid out that same wing with a couple lines. I've done that so that I can tell you some of the names that I think I've discovered for what some of these things ought to be. We'll start here on the right for this wing that sticks out on the left hand side. In between these two lines, right here, this one is called the root cord. A cord is a line that you can draw along the wing like this. So this blue line is also a cord. And this one over here on the tip is a cord. In fact, in between here, that's called the tip cord. The one right here that I've drawn in blue is called the mean aerodynamic cord. Mean stands for average. Then down along the bottom in between these two lines here, we have the width of the wing which is the span of that wing. You've surely heard of the wingspan of an airplane, and that would be from the one tip of one wing all the way to the tip of the other. It includes the fuselage. In this case, when I'm setting up FAR, I think I'm only supposed to measure not half of the fuselage as well, but just the wing part itself. So that's what I'm going to do, and this in between here, we will label as B. And because it's only one half of the wingspan of just part the wing parts, I'll say it's B over 2. Next we have a sweep values. So right here, I looked on the wiki, and this line is supposed to be about 81 degrees. And this line here, it said, was 45 degrees. There seems to be a little bit of tapering right here at the tip, and it kind of curves a little bit right in there, so I made it look like that. But for the most part, it's supposed to be 81 and 45, I think. Not really knowing exactly how that's supposed to be set up right here then, I decided to just average those two values, and I set my mid-chord sweep to that average. Maybe somebody out there will know whether that was what I was supposed to do or not. Speaking of mass values, remember last episode I was talking about masses and how they were not uh, coming out even close to the same for different websites that I was going to? Well, if we go back to the shuttle, not the space shuttle, I want the shuttle orbiter. There we go, space shuttle orbiter. If we go back here and we scroll down a bit, we're going to see in this section where I had found the empty weight at 68 tons, and then I was confused because at other places I found it 70 something and another that it was even higher than that. Well, some people were guessing, oh, I think it's because the heat tiles are different. Well, that was not it. Or, oh, it's because the shuttles all had different masses. And while that's true, and I knew that, that was not it either, because shuttles were not different by 20 tons. But one fan did figure out exactly what was going on with this number. This number right here does not include the engines. These right here, the SSME main shuttle engines, are a little over 3 tons each. And if you take 3 of those, and you add them into this mass right here, then you do get a number in the 70 tons 
that is very close to a lot of the other numbers that I figured out. So that's the number that I'm really going with. We're going to take this, add these three engines, and then we have the correct weight. Then they're all off only by the little differences that each individual shuttle had since the shuttles got lighter as they got went through their different versions. We can go back and take a look at this website that I had here where I found this really good image of the shuttle and this will make much more sense. See, mean aerodynamic cord, 474 inches and it goes right through there just like on the image that I had drawn. Also shown on here is the tip cord right there, 137.87. So this picture made things much easier for calculating those sorts of values. Taking all of that and just converting it into meters like the root cord here is shown as well, we can go to the actual Ferrum Aerospace numbers and see how those are supposed to be entered. And so that brings us to here. We are looking at the CSS wings for both the left and the right hand side. In Ferrum, there's a special module called the Wing Aerodynamic Model that needs to be attached to wing parts. I put in some comments with the different values that we had found. Remember, we have the wing span, the mean aerodynamic cord, the root cord, and the tip cord. This will allow us to also calculate this value right here, the taper ratio, which is the tip divided by the root. And remember I had talked about the mid-chord sweep that needs to be entered, and I did an average of the 81 and the 45 to put right there, but again I'm not sure if that's what I'm supposed to do for this one. Here's B divided by 2 being the wing span, or just the span of that one wing, which I have there, and the mean aerodynamic chord right there. So these four values get set up for the ferrum numbers. Note that these are actually modified a little bit because the wings in Ferrum are divided into two parts. There's the control surface and the wing itself. So I did a second control surface section where I put its own mean aerodynamic cord, its own span, taper ratio, mid cord sweep, and they all seem to have this max deflection set to 15. So I did that as well by default because if it's not supposed to be 15, I don't know what it's supposed to be. I also did it down here for the stabilizer, the tail part, again taking numbers out of that image that we had found. I was able to set up those four values and likewise the stabilizer's control surface has its own numbers. Then all of those numbers can be validated by using the Ferrum Aerospace debug menu. You pull up Ferrum, you go on the far right here for the button for the debug far values. Make sure you switch it into the mode where you can change action groups. And at that point, when you click on different parts, it will bring up all of the values and all of the curves that are being used in order to represent those wings within Ferrum. So coming back here to take a look at the wing, I noticed when I was right clicking on it that it has a mass strength value. And earlier I had said that the mass values of the wings weren't what I had set and that I thought it was a far feature. Well sure enough, if I drag this strength value around, you can see the current wing mass is changing. So I'll probably just drag that until I get it to the proper wing mass that I'm looking for. When I'm setting up my wings for real, then eventually I felt like I was ready to bring it out on the pad, open up the gear so that we can try a lift off facing backward on the pad so that we, once we do lift off, we can then land again somewhere. If I lift off in the other direction going the normal way on that strip, then we will end up going crashing into the ocean. But while I'm out here, I'm noticing two problems. One, the flames are constantly coming out the back, so I still have to fix my hot rockets. And two, when I activated the landing gear, it lifted up the nose, and even though there is no SAS, no gyroscopes, nothing like that going on, the nose won't drop back down again. So there was obviously something wrong with the lift values. Apparently there's enough lift on this that just sitting there on the pad, it doesn't want to drop the nose back down again. Nonetheless, I activated the engines just to see what would happen, and you can see the result here. It went into quite an interesting little spin and disintegrated. <laughs> Normally I'd revert right here, but this one's just too cool. I had to let this one go. Watch the pieces flying all over the place like that.
It's like a little 4th of July firework. So then I reverted back to the assembly building there. Well, the SPH, I guess. Brought it back out here after some changes and now it drops down again. So I was thinking this was going to be a bit better. So activating the infinite fuel cheat, since obviously there's no big tank on the outside there in order to provide fuel, we give it another try, activating that fuel then causes the engines to go, and unfortunately, up we go again. I'm thinking it has a little bit too much lift in the nose, and now it's going to be time for me to figure out how to fix that. But at least we can make a two-point landing. Well, maybe that's a three-point landing. Look at that. It's on one wing, it's tail stabilizer, and an engine. That is a three-point landing. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.